Welcome to Behind the Breakthrough, the podcast all about groundbreaking medical research and the people behind it at Toronto's University Health Network, Canada's largest research and teaching hospital. I'm your host, Christian Cote. Our guest today is Dr. Mathieu Lupien, senior scientist at UHN's Princess Margaret Cancer Centre. He's a pioneer in the exploration and understanding of the human genome and its role in causing cancer. He'll join us in a minute, but first, here's the backstory on Dr. Mathieu Lupien. Growing up in saint jerome Quebec, in an all-French household in the 1980s, Mathieu Lupien's heroes were scientists, people who made amazing discoveries, such as Madame Curie, Louis Pasteur. By grade seven, young Mathieu knows his passion in life is to study life, those organisms and elements that make up our bodies. So after high school, Mathieu chooses to study biology at the prestigious McGill University in Montreal, where classes, by the way, are conducted in English. Mathieu is undaunted by the fact he doesn't speak the language and decides he'll learn it at the same time he pursues his degree. In 1999, he graduates with a BSc, followed by a PhD in 2005. And then Dr. Lupien enters the research world to study the human genome and its connection to cancer. What gives cancer life in the body? How and where does it start? With the hope of one day stopping the disease from ever starting. Dr. Mathieu Lepien, Senior Scientist at UHN's Princess Margaret Cancer Centre. Welcome to Behind the Breakthrough. Thank you for having me. Mathieu, how does cancer get started? So cancer itself is a process where a cell can no longer differentiate, can no longer be, for instance, a skin cell or a muscle cell or something of that flavor. Instead, what happens is that the processes that regulate the capacity of cells to differentiate are broken. And there's multiple checkpoints, right? So you need to have multiple processes affected uh, for a cell to lose its capacity to be normal and become a cancer cell. And then in the process, once all these checkpoints are broken, what happens is that the cell loses its identity. So a cancer cell is a cell that has lost its identity. And often in the process, what happens is that that cell starts dividing. So instead of only having one, you have two, you have four, you have eight, and so on and so forth. And that creates a mass because the cells are constantly dividing and dividing. It creates a mass that we call the tumor. And what does that mass do? So that mass then is going to be drawing in all the energy that it can to be able to grow more and more because its concept is to grow. The ultimate concept of a tumor is to grow and grow and grow. So it sucks in all the energy. So it will draw in blood, will draw in blood vessels, uh, will draw in the energy that it can. Now, in the same process, at one point, you'll have the immune system that will come in to try to fight it off. And so it will learn ways to block the immune system, find ways to hide from the immune system in order to keep proliferating and keep using up all the energy that it can from the host. Now, Matthew, I want to do something a little different on the podcast today because I think to help me and I think also our audience understand your pioneering research, it's like we needed a crash course in the human genome, if you don't mind. What is the human genome and what does it do? All right. So the human genome, you can see it a little bit more like a, an encyclopedia, the encyclopedia of the, what's required to make a human being. Uh, it's a gigantic book that contains over 3 billion letters. Uh, and these letters will form words, sentences, paragraphs, and the likes to really provide all the information that's required to make a human being. Um, as opposed to having an alphabet of 26 letters, uh, the human genome consists of an alphabet of four letters. And that same encyclopedia is found in every single cell of your body. Every single cell of your body. Yet, you do have diversity in the shapes, like your ear does not look like your mouth, and so on and so forth. And so, the system has learned to use different parts of that encyclopedia to be able to make an ear versus make a foot versus make an eye, and so on and so forth. So, I guess you could say this is like a blueprint for the human body. Like, I guess I'm still trying to figure out or understand what's it made up of. Right. So it's really like a book. It's really the equivalent of a book. It's a string of letters 
that are organized in specific orders to provide keywords that our cells know how to interpret. They know that a certain string of letters implies that there in that specific region of the encyclopedia that we call the human genome, there is all the information that's required to make the key building blocks of a brain cell, like a neuron or a muscle cell. And if you don't mind, indulge me a little further. DNA, what's that? Right. So the DNA is the name we gave to the string of letters that make up the human genome. So they're different from genes. How do they interact or influence genes? So genes are individual units that are found within the human genome. Okay, so you have to take into account this notion that, as I said, the, if we, again, keep up with this an analogy of the encyclopedia, uh, you need to have sentences, phrases, uh, uh, paragraphs, and the like that are meaningful. And so within this, each sentence, you'll have um, all that you need, a noun, a verb, and so on, an adjective, and so on and so forth. So a gene can be seen as a noun. It gives you a specific context, a specific identity, a specific item that you'll influence, that you'll either say, let's have more of this one or let's have less of this one. And so a gene itself is a unit of the genome um, that I often refer to as a noun, uh, which is there to encode for proteins. And proteins are an active form that is uh, generated out of our DNA that can actually engage in specific catalytic activity within the cell. Um, so what that means is that um, a protein, which comes out, that is, that is encoded by a gene, more or less corresponds to um, hmm, a superhero in a book or something of that flavor that is engaged in an action shot. And so that protein will do something specific, will catalyze an activity that will ensure that your cell behaves the way it should be behaving. So instead of creating a bone or a, some kind of muscle, it creates a liver. For instance. Okay. I think I'm catching on. So I'm thinking also maybe a little history lesson might be useful here in terms of understanding how do we, how do we know about the human genome? How did that come about? So there was a world, an international initiative to actually uh, move forward and sequencing the human genome from start to end. Uh, prior to that initiative, we knew of individual genes being involved in the development of one disease versus another disease, uh, but we never had a full picture. Uh, and so at one point, the scientific community, in alignment with uh, politicians actually that supported this initiative, agreed to move forward in sequencing enough individuals to be able to have a clear sense of what's the reference human genome, which is a reference, right? It's a, uh, it's the, an encyclopedia that's an average of what each and every single one of us would have in every single cell of our body. Um, and so that was outstanding. That was a fabulous effort because in the process, we learned a lot. Um, we learned, for instance, that even though genes are often the focus of all that you hear in the public domain about scientific discoveries, uh, genes are not all that there is to be focusing on. Genes actually only account for about 1.5% of our human genome. And so that leaves 98.5% out there uh, for which we had no clue of the function at the time. But if you think of it, would you be carrying around 98.5% of a book for no reason in your backpack? Not quite, right? So there's definitely a lot of functions that have been ascribed to that 98.5% of the genome, but that came because we knew that it existed and because we knew where to look and that because we knew that we could interrogate that uh, non-coding space. So this is a, a, an important turning point. So I want to drill down a bit into this because what you've been talking about is the Human Genome Project, right? Correct. That was started back in the early 90s. And this mapping of genes in our bodies under the auspices of this project took about, I don't know, 12, 13. It was in the early 2000s that it reported. Correct. So just take me back then uh, to that time. What was the potential? What did researchers and scientists hope to do with this information of mapping the genome? Well, so we knew that um, genes were important, but we needed to identify how many more genes there were, 
Like the concept was that we're a complex organism, so we must be filled with genes if genes are so important. And yet at that time, we had not yet identified what we thought was the sum of all genes. And so I think that there was a strong push at that time to sequence the human genome with the hope of being able to identify the sum of all genes. And so at one point, people expected that we would have over 100,000 genes in our genome, 50,000 genes, like big numbers. It turns out that it's closer to 20, 26,000 genes that we have in the end. And so that effort was definitely initially geared towards, I think, making a better map of all the genes that are out there because we were so gene-centric in our mind of thinking, in our way of thinking, that we needed to find all genes. Um, in the process, we discovered a whole lot more. And what was the promise back then, Matt, if you don't mind, I want to come back at this again because it, it might help us understand why it's so important. Like, What could it tell us or what was mm -hmm. it going to do in terms of furthering research uh, f for the people who are working on the project? Right. So at that time, for sure, uh, genes had been clearly established as uh, key, key elements disrupted in disease. So we knew, for instance, that if you had a mutation in a given gene, you were likely to have a cancer or likely to have... Um, Huntington are likely to have another disease, like genetically inherited diseases, those diseases that individual pass down from generation to generation uh, or that inherited from, uh, from their parents. Um, there was a strong bias back in the 90s that those were driven by genes, that mutations in genes would be key determining factors in the likelihood of developing a, a given disease. There were a lot of evidence supporting that notion. And so the concept was, let's find all the genes so that this way we can find all the genetic causes of disease. Terrific. So I found curious when I was doing research for preparing for our, our chat today that it seems almost as soon as the Human Genome Project wrapped up in the early 2000s, as soon as it presented its findings, it seems almost immediately that researchers realized, and you've hinted at this, that while helpful in advancing uh, you know, the field of gene study uh, and how that governs the, the human body, that genes are actually only a small fraction of the human genome, only 1.5%, as you pointed out. So what happened there? Why was that 98.5% of the rest of our genome left uncharted? Right. So I'll actually also use that example just before I answer your question to showcase like a fundamental aspect of research. We initiate our research with a clear hypothesis, with a clear expectation, but that expectation is not necessarily met. But it doesn't mean we're not going to discover something we still manage to discover something, and it opens up our mind to an alternative interpretation of the data. And, and that's critical. That's a critical concept within the scientific endeavor. We formulate hypotheses, we move forward with them because we see that they're supported with the existing evidence. But then in the process, if we find something different, we're not gonna say, no, that's not the case. We're gonna observe it and we're gonna acknowledge it and we're gonna work with it. And so when the human genome uh, sequencing was completed and it was, then release that, look, there's only 1.5% of our genome that encodes for uh, genes for pro that can give rise to proteins and the likes. Um, we're like, all right, well, now there's this 98.5% that's left. Clearly, there has to be something to do with that 98.5%. And so that launched a completely new initiative to better understand exactly what the role of that 98.5% was. So, some, as you say, people begin that work of mapping the remaining 98.5%, and to understand it better, which is about the same time you're finishing your PhD at McGill in biology, and actually at the time you're studying about genes. Tell us about that. Right. So this is, uh, yeah, this is following science, right? So at the same time that the human genome was completed, that also allowed for a, a large number of new technologies to be developed. Uh, a number of new technologies actually geared to be able to understand the genome regardless of whether we were looking at the non-coding or the coding space, like the genes or the non-gene space. Um, and so when I did the transition from uh, completing my PhD at McGill University to then start a postdoctoral fellow at um, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, affiliated with Harvard University, um, I actually had the chance to tap into these emerging technologies. And even though at the time the studies that we were focusing on were looking at genes still, our mind frame had switched. We weren't anymore looking at the genes themselves and trying to figure out if there's mutations in them that could contribute to cancer, because at the time I was working on breast cancer. Uh, what we started doing was like, okay, we have these genes that we know are contributing to ca breast cancer development, but so how is it that they're 
expression is regulated. So how is it that the cells know how much of it to use to give rise to proteins? Uh, and that's what led us into looking at the non-coding space. Because what we discovered in the process is that that non-coding space was filled with individual functional units that were critical to regulate how much of a gene a cell uses. So if you want an analogy for this, if you think of a gene, let's say, as a light bulb. I like to use it as a light bulb, okay? Now, if you turn it on, it creates light. So light will would be the equivalent of a gene being expressed to give rise to a protein. Now, turning it on is a process. It's a process that requires elements that are not the light bulb, right? And they're not the gene. And they're not the gene, right? If the gene is the light bulb, then whatever turns the light bulb on is not the gene. It's an element that's independent, per se, in, in, in design to the gene, but that still plays a role in regulating how much of that gene will be expressed, how much of that light will be turned on. And so that can be seen, for instance, in our daily life as a light switch and a dimmer. So the light switch turns it on, the dimmer regulates how much of that light comes out from that light bulb. So it's the same principle for genes. For genes to be expressed, you need to have a light, a switch that's turned on, and then you need to have a large number of dimmers that fine tune how much of it is being expressed. And all of these dimmers and light switches fall in the non-coding space. That 98 0.5% wilderness that had not been charted by the human genome. Exactly. It's not all of it. 98.5 is not just light switches and, and dimmers, but depending on the estimates, right now we're around 20 to 40% of the non-coding space corresponding to switches and light dimmers. And what, you know what I find interesting at this time was the sort of transition from human genome project to studying the 98.5% that had not been charted is correct me if I'm wrong, there was some resistance. Well, whenever is, you propose something new, which is, again, a fundamental concept within science, which is good, people will criticize it. But that's our daily job. We want to make sure that we identify the truth. And to identify the truth, the truth means coming up with a hypothesis, testing it, putting it forward, and then allowing our peers to reassess our work, to then also engage in their own studies, to validate or disprove. Can it be replicated? Exactly. And if it's disproved, we're fine with it. But then again, we'll have to assess the extent to which it can be disproved. This resistance, though, is that what gave rise to kind of the sinister name of this 98.5% wilderness? Right. So back in the early 2000s, that 98.5% was referred to as junk DNA. And that was definitely a strong bias in its interpretation. Uh, it was luckily. also called the dark genome. So the dark genome is more recent, actually, because the dark genome has a positive connotation, ah. right? Because the dark matter and the likes, like, these are concepts that we agree exist. And so acknowledging that it exists is a big deal. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely at first it was referred to as junk DNA. And junk, clearly that's not, that's pejorative, right? It's not positive. Um, but the dark matter, I'm okay with. Like we're investigating, engaging in... Uh, dark exploring genome. Exploring the dark yeah. genome. I'm, yeah. I'm totally fine with that. So I'm curious, back in 2005, graduating, or uh, sorry, completing your PhD, you're at Dana-Farber at Harvard. What drew you then to studying this 98.5% where there was some kind of resistance, actually, from the scientific world and parts of it to, to go after it? Right. So, so two aspects. So first, technology was enabling us to actually study it very effectively. Uh, the second aspect that was very engaging as well was this notion that each cell in your body, again, has the same sequence. Like the human genome is different between me and you, but within each of us, the human genome is more or less relatively the same across all the cells that make up our body. But yet, again, they don't look the same, right? A neuron does not look like a muscle cell, does not look like, right? Your foot does not look like your hands or whatever else. Thank goodness. So, yeah. So, so I was puzzled by this notion, but not in a normal development concept, but more in a disease concept. So, again, there in cancer, for instance, we have some specific uh, genes, which we know are oncogenes, so drivers of transformation, drivers of, of, of cancer development. And sometimes the exact same oncogene Sorry, is oncogene? Oncogene, yeah, for onco, yeah, onco, oncogene. Oncogene, I see, uh, on, on, in yeah, terms of oncology, yeah. short oncology. for oncology. Yeah, exactly, a gene Sorry. that promotes cancer, so we can call them oncogenes. Got you. Uh, and so those are genes that are not 
necessarily different. Like they're the same genes often that are used for normal development. It's just that their regulation or their function is altered and and, and to promote cancer development. And so at the time, I was puzzled by the fact that the same oncogene could be involved in different cancer types, and yet these different cancer types were not at all identical. They were completely different. And so I had to figure out why an oncogene would work in a certain way in one uh, cancer cell and in a different way in a cancer cell from a different tissue of origin. So let's go further here. What have you discovered uh, then in this dark genome, if you want, to, if we're going to call it that now, yeah. that you know goes on in your lab? What are you discovering? Right. So uh, there's mul- multiple aspects. So the um, one of the most critical discoveries that we made uh, in the late twenty, well, around twenty twenty eight. 2008, sorry, um, uh, 2009, um, was this notion that, yes, you could have an oncogene giving rise to a protein that actually would behave differently in one cancer type versus another. And the reason we could account for these differences were based on what I call the readability of the human genome. The readability. The readability of the human genome. So we talked about light switches and dimmers. So even though you have light switches and dimmers that are at at specific locations in the human genome, again, they're not all used in all cell types. So a subset of them will be used in one cell type, another subset will be used in a different cell type. And it was always a challenge to be able to figure out exactly which ones are used in cell type one versus which ones are used in cell type two. And so in 2008, approximately, um, we started looking at an additional layer of information that's provided on the human genome, uh, which refers to um, the concept of epigenetics. Um, So epigenetics is more or less the process of bookmarking the human genome, telling the system which light switches should be used, telling the system which genes should be differentially expressed, telling the system which dimmers should be used. Um, And so we started characterizing these these, uh, bookmarks that are coming out from the process of epigenetics. Um, If you want an analogy, for instance, uh, the human genome, I referred to it as an encyclopedia in the past. You can also visualize it as um, uh, the map of all roads and cities that we have uh, for for, for our planet, our country, uh, whatever scale you want to use. While we know where the cities are, while we know where the roads are, which is the equivalent of having the human genome, um, if you want to make your ways from one city to another, maps are useful. But if you can have guidance, right, if you can have road signs that tells you, yes, you're on track to make it to the next city. Yes, whatever, saint Jérôme is 500 kilometers ahead or something of that Better take this exit. Take this exit and so on and so forth. That's very useful. So all these uh, signs are like epigenetic bookmarking of the human genome. It tells the system which route to take in order to reach the endpoint that's desired. So then tell us, give us a sense of how important is understanding that to helping us with understanding cancer and how it starts in the body. Right. So again, going in around 2005 and and subsequent years, uh, individual labs like my own, as well as international uh, international efforts, were put forward to effectively annotate all the maps of the human genome, all the maps that are unique to a brain cell, all the maps that are unique to a muscle cell, and so on and so forth. Um, and so we engage in that process uh, over the years, uh, to the point where now we have very good maps of over a hundred different tissue types. So that within a single individual, we can have a sense of which parts of the human genomes are being used to make a muscle cell, which parts are being used to make a neuron. I go, I keep going back to these examples, but those are the, always the ones that I come up with. But they, definitely, there's we have these maps now. Of course, in cancer, there's a problem, right? There's multiple different problems that can arise. Uh, and having these maps is extraordinarily useful in being able to make sense of these problems. All right, so let's go back to this analogy of... Um, the human genome being the map of all roads and cities in a given area, uh, and the um, fact as well, that, for instance, in cancer, that it's a genetic disease, right? There's going to be mutations acquired that are going to promote, give rise to a tumor. So if we think of mutations as meteorites that come crashing down on Earth, well, some will fall on a road, and that's going to be a problem. 
right? So that's a cancer, that's a mutation that we would call a driver mutation because it's a mutation that destroys the road that you're supposed to take or destroys the city that you're supposed to uh, end up in and that's a major problem, okay? So those are driver mutations, they change the landscape. Now, you can also have what we call passenger mutations. So that would be, for instance, a meteorite that falls far in the forest where nobody lives. You wouldn't see it, right? It would not impact your road. You'd still be able to make your way all the way out to whichever endpoint you need to make. And so having knowledge of the maps allows us to discriminate these mutations that are doing something, contributing to cancer development versus not having much of an impact. So in terms of the meteorites that you're able to identify landing on roads that block our travel, take us to that step of how that helps you perhaps predict or at least understand better the, the beginnings of cancer in the body. Right. So one of the major discoveries that we uh, made in the last uh, eight years uh, was the following. Before the human genome sequence was completed, before we could effectively annotate all these maps, the focus had always been put on the genes. The mutations in the genes are the drivers. Those were the driver mutations, okay? And that's why then we had this term oncogenes, because we had genes that we could, we could easily identify as being commonly mutated in specific spots. We also had another term at that time put forward, which was tumor suppressor genes, which were genes that once destroyed would actually no longer be able to prevent cancer from arising. So you had the two uh, positive and negative forces. But still, those were identified based on having mutations falling within those, those genes. Now, having access to the entire human genome, acknowledging that there's more than just genes, what we actually realized was that um, most of the mutations, actually, that make a tumor, a tumor, most of the mutations that assist in developing and progressing and allowing for the development of a, a cancer cell don't map the genes. The vast majority map outside of genes. The vast majority actually specifically target those light switches and those dimmers because it's a whole lot more effective to simply regulate, increase a little bit or decrease a little uh -huh. bit the expression of a given gene to change the nature of a given cell. So, so, if you so go, just so I understand, so, sorry to interrupt, but that cancer cells are originating then in that dark genome. A lot not of it just does, in genes. Not just in genes. So that that is a so you're advancing instance, the field here in terms of an understanding of where cancer comes from. Right. So if we go back again to this analogy of the light bulb. Mm -hmm. So if you want to change the mood in a room, mm -hmm. what's the most effective? Is it the Candles. break? Is it the yeah exactly <laughs> right? So it's not to break the it's not to break the light bulb, because then you go from too much light to not enough light. The best way to change a change a mood in a given room is to simply dim down the light or dim it up, depending on what you want to do, or start flickering. Like if you want to have a discotheque, you just start flickering that light bulb, right? It's going to be much more effective. Same principle. If you want to change a normal cell's identity, then bring it to more towards a cancer cell identity, play with the light, increase it a little bit more, dim the light, increase the light, start flickering it. And that's what goes on. So these elements in the dark genome are critical to really understanding the full picture of how cancer get started in the body. Absolutely. And so that's why in today's world, we're moving more and more towards an approach where we don't just look at genes, but we take a comprehensive view of mutations across the entire genome to try to make sense of the nature of someone's tumor as opposed to someone else's tumor. Is there, is there a particular paper then that you're proud of that you might want to direct us to that uh, we should know about? Tell, or you, maybe you could tell us about it. So, so this is a very interesting concept. Again, going back to the underlying principle of science. Each paper is like a chapter, if we're lucky, or a big paragraph uh, <laughs> to a full story that we're all trying to write. And the other concept is also that it's not uh, a book that we're going to write that's led by a single author. There's hundreds and thousands of authors around the world. So to point you to one paper as opposed to uh, a collection, a body of work would be very, very difficult. This is a, an international effort. There are scientists here, and we can be proud that we're leaders in a number of fields, uh, but that also work in partnership with scientists in the U.S. and China, name it, all over, all over the world. And so to point you to one paper as opposed to another would be a little bit more challenging than I would like. Then if you don't mind, Matthew, paint a picture for us of when we come, if we came to your lab, what would, what's happening in your lab today? Right. So, so what I've discussed is what we've done so far. So now we're already embarking in the next phase. 
Uh, and so the next phase allows us to keep making more sense of how mutations found just about anywhere in the genome can contribute to cancer. But what we're realizing as well is that um, in cancer, the roads change independently of meteorites. And so the signs are changed, okay? So you might normally think that you can make your fastest way from one city to another by just following the, the, the signs that are out there. The problem is that a cancer cell will change those signs. And so it has nothing to do with genetics. It's not changing the road per se, but it's going to put you on a different road. And so instead of making your way directly to wherever you want to go, you'll be taking a huge detour. And that detour will slow down your cell's ability to be fully reaching its potential. And so in that process, it might transform and become a cancer cell. So these things all work together. So that's where we are right now. We're looking at how the signs are being changed with or without mutations. So with or without the meteorites. You're listening to Behind the Breakthrough, a podcast about groundbreaking medical research and the people behind it at University Health Network in Toronto, Canada's largest teaching and research hospital. I'm your host, Christian Cote, and we're speaking to Dr. Mathieu Lepien, senior scientist at UHN's Princess Margaret Cancer Centre. Mathieu, your study now of this dark genome and how it relates to the genesis of cancer, what's your sense of where is this field of study going? Yeah, there's so definitely there's um, technology development is a huge contributor to how far we can go. Our goal is always to go as far as possible. Um, to be able to predict where we're going um, is very difficult because scientists are adapting. We're constantly reanalyzing the data that we have, constantly generating new data and adjusting our hypothesis based on what the data is telling us. And so to be able to effectively predict where we're going um, is a challenge. But definitely right now, there's uh, a strong push towards ensuring that um, we are as comprehensive as possible in our analysis. So now we've made the transition. The, this notion of looking at one gene at a time or to only be looking at genes, we're done with that. Now we're truly taking a comprehensive approach to the entire genome. We're taking into account all the DNA sequences, so all these single letters that make up the human genome and how they are changed in one tumor, for instance, or not, so how mutations are changing the code. Um, and now we're gradually adding all these additional layers that I mentioned about, like the bookmarking, those road signs um, that influence the roads that are made available within the cell versus another cell. Um, so just to give a perspective, with regards to uh, mutations, that's one layer of information. Now that we start looking at road signs, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of alternative layers of information that can dictate the path that are made available in one cell versus another cell. And so we're just embarking in that process. Um, and so I expect that we'll be definitely doing major leap forwards by investigating exactly what these layers have to provide information-wise with regards to normal state versus disease state. But give me a sense that if you, you know, you're a young guy, what's your dream in your lifetime of this leading to, in, in terms of impact? So every day is a dream as far as I'm concerned, because every day we discover something new and that concept is, is what drives us to move forward, right? It's, a, it's the concept of being astonished by a new discovery uh, that fuels our imagination. Um, what's the end point? I don't know that there is an end point, but it's a, but it's a, it's a path that's extraordinarily enjoyable. And the key concept is really to make the most that we can make of it to better understand how life is structured and built uh, so that we can better understand how it's disrupted in disease. Um, but uh, it's an everlasting journey. It, it strikes me also that like the discovery of, say, for example, these elements in the dark genome and these other, the, the, you mentioned that the, the meteorites and the uh, road signs, these are things that have you've discovered in just, what, less than the last 15 years, which is a long time to us in human years, but I'm guessing it's a nanosecond when it comes to research. Yeah, the pace at which research has picked up over, I would say, yeah, the last uh, 30 years has been impressive. Uh, and so we're constantly adjusting what we do. Uh, and it's extraordinarily challenging, but extraordinarily amusing as well at the same time. But so I can tell you from my own experience, the research program that I lead is in constant evolution. Um, some of the research we did 10 years ago, we still do some of it, 
but it's probably now accounting for a third of the ongoing research in my group. Now we spend a lot of time in looking at other aspects that we could only really start looking at in the last five years or so because of technology development. Um, but now we can, and so we do it. And so research lab in today's world have to be able to rapidly adapt to the changing landscape, um, changing landscape both in discoveries as much as in technology. And I guess my sense is this underscores, though, that something we often forget is that, uh, you know, everyone wants a cure, of course, for things like diseases like cancer. But um, research takes time, doesn't it? Yeah, the transfer of information, like from the first discovery to it making its way in the clinical domain can take decades. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, is so that's that frustrating why for you? It's part of the process. We try to accelerate this as much as possible, um, but it's part of the process, and it's because we do our due diligence. It's because we want to make sure that our discoveries are correct, that they're they're reproducible, they're robust, uh, and such that we don't bring anything that's false all the way up to the clinic. So by the time it reaches the clinic, the scientific community is very much aware of the positive and negative aspects of, of, of what the technology or what the discovery has to offer. Uh, and so in that line of thought, um, I think it's a, an important process to be diligent as opposed to uh, speeding things through. I've heard one scientist actually say, if, if you can't handle failure, you shouldn't probably be in scientific research. What's your take on that? Absolutely. You need to love to be criticized. <laughs> That's a given. But it's part of, yeah, exactly. It's part of the, so there's different ways of criticizing individuals or, or being criticized, right? There can be constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. So that's one. So, and that's all fine. Uh, and, and that one is always appreciated. And then independently of this, it's true. Uh, 90 plus percent of what we do will fail. And that's just because we formulate, well, I don't know. I put a number out. Definitely it depends on the individuals. Some would say it's only 10%, but I'm, I'm okay saying that 80% or plus of what I've tried has failed because you need to be imaginative. And you need to think outside the box and you're exploring something that no one has ever explored before. So the key question is, are you correct or not? Is, are the tools that you have access to uh, capable of addressing the question you're putting forward? And uh, is the biology completely different from what you expected it to be? And so the key thing from a scientific perspective is ability to constantly analyze the data and reassess reassess and reassess and reassess. So when I put down like a number like 80%, it's not 80% of research that we invest in for years and years and years. It's 80% uh, or so, whatever the percentage is, of research that we initiate and we have some results and we realize that these results don't fit with the initial hypothesis and we readjust our hypothesis so as to be able to move forward. But in terms of moving forward, it's not an 80% failure. In terms of moving forward, it's a 90 plus percent success rate. We always move forward and we always make discoveries and we always deliver. It's, a, it's more an issue that we deliver because we readjust, we reassess. Because when you explore the unknown, I mean, none of us has um, uh, absolute knowledge. And so we have to agree with this and just acknowledge that not everything that we come up with as a hypothesis will be correct and adjust along the way. How much for you, how important for you is, is the notion of team or collaboration in then in this process? Because it, it sounds mind-boggling what you're trying to stay on top of, make your adjustments, keep learning, and advance. Right. So, and I would say that in today's research, it's even more important than it used to be to be a team scientist because there's just so many fields of expertise uh, that have reached a level where no one can be an expert at every single one of them. And if you want to be able to make the most impactful, the most uh, game-changing discovery, you benefit from interacting with your peers. Uh, you benefit from reaching out to individuals that have expertise in different uh, aspects of research. And um, so from my point of view, team research is not only effective, but it's the most uh, promising avenue for the future of research. What's the road been like for you so far? You're you know, roughly, what, 13, 15 years into your career from after graduating with your PhD or PhD. What's, what's the road been like for you? It's been fun. And that's why I'm still here. <laughs> Happiness is key. And so every morning I come to work and I'm excited. Uh, again, so I, I, I grew up with, uh, as a kid with this notion that I translated one day to astonishment is the source of imagination. Uh, that's 
what drives me. Who wrote me. that? So it's, uh, I remember it as a kid being something that, I, that was portrayed in one of those um, uh, shows. Uh, so Sully Goblet, to be very specific, is a TV show that I watched as a kid, which was meant on educating kids. And I remember, for I don't know why, but that single sentence stuck with me for the rest of my life. Astonishment? Astonishment, astonishment is the source of imagination. You could write that on your lab wall. I, I say it often enough that I don't need to write it, but yes. <laughs> you're, no, you're what's known as a pure scientist. Am I, am I correct. correct? Like your time is spent 100% in the lab, writing papers. You, you don't see patients. So what keeps patients top of mind for you? Well, that's easy. Um, um, right? I, I work on cancer. I worked on um, predominantly breast, prostate cancer. I also do some work on brain and leukemia. Um, it's, it's easy. Cancer is personal, right? For every single one of us uh, in the research labs, um, we all have someone close to our heart that's either currently going through treatment or that recently passed away uh, from cancer. And so the motivation is very, very, very um, easy. It's really uh, personal. I understand you also carry a small reminder of your mission. Correct. Every day. Yes. About what, to remind you of what this work is all about. Wherever yes. you go, yes. Can you tell us that story? Yeah. So, um, so we all know Terry Fox. We all know that Terry Fox uh, uh, has been the image uh, of uh, cancer research in the country. And so, when I was a kid, Terry Fox was—I I was too young to remember him per se. But growing up as a scientist, every single lab that I had the chance to work in always had like a picture of Terry Fox somewhere. We always had a reminder of Terry Fox. Uh, when I went to the U.S., Terry Fox was not so commonly seen in the U.S. Uh, but at one point, they came out with these uh, loonies that had uh, uh, Terry uh, Terry on it. And so uh, um, the first one that I grabbed, I kept it. And I always have it with me. It's in my pocket. I always have my Terry Fox loony with me uh, as a reminder of what we do and why we do it. I think he's a, a great example of uh, commitment and, and a reminder of the importance of uh, the work we do. You're carrying that right now? Yes special to you? It is. And it's been, yeah, there in the pocket every day. Uh, what's your approach to mentorship, inspiring the people in your lab that you work with every day? So uh, my mode of operation is uh, to provide them freedom, uh, freedom to think, freedom to act, freedom to be, uh, to, to achieve their full potential. Um, there's nothing more important in my mind than freedom. And it's interesting because at the same time, it's scary. Because when you have freedom, you have to you have to take into account the responsibilities that come with it, um, and but typically the trainees adjust very quickly and they learn to appreciate this notion that yes, they can think independently and engage with me as if I was a peer as opposed to their professor, mentor, or boss, and that makes a huge difference because we can engage in arguments about uh, how the system works, how we should formulate our hypothesis, and they feel totally confident in moving forward with their hypothesis and discussing it. They don't shy away from voicing their opinion. And I think that there's nothing more important than that for a young scientist to develop and to be able to become a, the leader or a leader in the field of cancer research. So you foster an environment where you're challenged by them. Absolutely. And you're okay with that. Absolutely. I love it. That's great. Is there a mentor in your life or career who stands out? Absolutely. And what what made their presence so critical? So the, the Miles Brown, who was my mentor during my uh, postdoctoral training at uh, at the Dana Farber uh, Cancer Institute in Boston, um, he's the one that first gave me freedom to do everything that I wanted the way I wanted, and that just pushed me beyond the boundaries of my initial limits, so that I could actually achieve more than I would have uh, without that freedom. Um, and yeah, absolutely, he's. Uh, he em embodies the ideal scientist in my perspective, uh, being excited about discoveries, whether it's his own or that of others, acknowledging the quality of the work from others, and always, always, always encouraging his people to be as independent and free in their thought as they can be. Now, there is another mentor from your past that I understand inspired you as well, a famous hockey player. Can you tell us about that? Why? Are you referring to a Maple Leaf player? <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? A good boy from Quebec? Are you serious? Yeah, no, correct. Yeah, so 
Well, growing up, yeah. So determination, right? Examples of determination. So you mentioned in the introduction that I had as uh, heroes, uh, Marie Curie, Louis Pasteur, and the like. Uh, I also had access to books back then that showed the uh, the uh, the contribution of Maurice Richard um, to all that he's done. So many uh, so many Stanley Cups and the like. So I always had him as a hero of uh, determination. Um, clearly, he succeeded in that field. What advice would you give young kids out there? Like today's kid from Saint Jerome who's interested in the study of biology or life or science. Yeah. So my first advice would be reach out, um, because you can't know what you might be getting yourself into without engaging with those that are doing it. And so any kid, for instance, that's but I like, can't walk off the street and call up Matthew Lupien and go, "Hey, Matthew, I'm 16 year old kid uh, interested in biology. Why not? What do I do? Why not?" Why not? I guess we'll put your email at the end of the so, show. <laughs> uh, please do. I have no problem with that. I mean, if there's one reason that I managed to make my way through all the different phases of my education, go to Har- like go to McGill, go to Harvard, and come here afterwards, um, it's uh, it's because I never shied away from engaging with individuals uh, that I thought that I had to engage with. You, you, yeah, and we're approachable individuals. We're approachable. I mean, it's just that uh, you have to reach out to us, but. Um, and sometimes you have to be imaginative because you can imagine that we don't have only one request a day. We have, uh, like, our, our, our workload is definitely keeping us very, very busy. Uh, so if you're approaching us in the right way that we notice, yeah, we'll engage for sure. Uh, we want to train the next generation. I mean, it's I've often gone to schools to teach them and explain to them my, my uh, career path. And uh, typically the kids are so excited to hear uh, about my career path or anybody else's, right? They want to know what's out there. And so and any kid that's out there should not shy away from reaching out. If you like something, go talk to the person that according to you is the person that's providing for the most exciting research or, or work in the line of thought that you have. That's great advice. Yeah. What's next for Mathieu Lupia? What's What should we be watching for? Um, so again, we're we're definitely engaged in doing more exciting research that can transform care. And I would say the fact that we're here at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center is a huge asset uh, because, as you've heard from the start, I've been heavily engaged in research that's uh, at the forefront of discovery, uh, potentially, some would argue, at the forefront of fundamental research. Uh, being here at the Princess Margaret uh, implies that we have the chance to regularly interact with the doctors, with the clinicians, that see patient, that can inform us of what's really needed in the clinic today uh, and of their exact needs and vice versa. We can teach them about what's to come. Uh, and so this two-way conversation is fabulous because it ensures that we work on what's most relevant and at the same time it maximizes the likelihood that any of our discoveries will be uptaken by the clinic to make an impact in care. Dr. Matthew LePiat, Senior Scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Thanks for speaking with us and continued success in your research. Thank you very much for the pleasure. For more on the podcast, go to our website, www.behindthebreakthrough.ca. And if you have any comment about the show, please let us know. Rate the podcast wherever you're listening. We crave feedback. That concludes this episode of Behind the Breakthrough, a podcast about groundbreaking medical research and the people behind it at University Health Network in Toronto, Canada's largest teaching and research hospital. I'm your host, Christian Cote.